So, Governor, uh, you referred to some reverse swings uh, coming your way. But, uh, you know, uh, uh, a governor who plays with such a straight bat, you know, it's difficult to, um, you know, the, the, instead the bowler gets hit out of the park. But um, I have a tough job on hand because the governor is sitting with me and I've to been told to watch the clock because there is a time constraint. So let me be as quick as possible. Governor, my first question to you is, you know, India needs to, according to RBI's own research paper, India needs to grow at about 7.6% annually over the next 25 years to become a developed nation. Now, for, to fund that kind of growth, the financial system has to be well capitalized. There has to be a lot of new financial institutions also coming in of all shapes and sizes. Given that background, is it time for the RBI to shed its hesitance or I should say reluctance to allow business houses, private equities, venture capital funds to have larger stakes in banking entities, your views. You see, banks are different. We have articulated on this issue a number of times. Banks are different, they're different from other businesses. Experience world over has shown that uh, real sector companies, when they enter the banking space, there are potential conflicts of interest. And also, the issue relating to related party transactions also is a major issue. And we had in our country, I mean, we had uh, several private uh, banks earlier. Of course, that was, I'm not going into the issue of bank nationalization, why it was done and what was the outcome and all that. But there are inherent, you know, inherent, there are potential conflicts of interest. And experience world over has shown that uh, it will be very difficult to, you know, monitor or to regulate the, uh, you know, to sort of uh, prevent the related party transactions. So the risks involved are very high. So therefore, world over, although there is no specific uh, bar on, uh, you know, uh, take the case of United States, for example, or take any other country emerging uh, market economy, uh, economies, uh, you know, it, it has not been done. And there are good reasons uh, why it has not been done. So far as India is concerned, the banking penetration has been quite wide. Today, the number of banks, the number of bank branches have become less relevant. I will not say irrelevant, but they have become less relevant. Because technology is achieving that for you. The reach is being achieved through technology. The reach, the customer reach and the reaching the, you know, the far-flung areas is being achieved through technology. It is also being achieved through several new business models. Take, for example, the BC model, the banking correspondent model, or the handheld uh, payment uh, equipments which they carry. So therefore, it's what India needs is not proliferation in the number of banks. What India needs is sound banks healthy banks, well-governed banks, which we feel will be able to mobilize savings throughout the country through technology, which will also be able to meet the credit requirements throughout the country through technology. And you have new, you know, new players, especially in the NBFC sector, who are entirely, you know, digital lenders for which the Reserve Bank has come out with uh, detailed guidelines. Having said that, I would like to say, that uh, we are open to receiving uh, uh, new applications for uh, new applications for uh, setting up uh, universal banks. And as and when an appropriate uh, fit and proper application comes, the Reserve Bank will not hesitate. I'm not implying for a moment that the today's number of banks is enough and no more license will be granted. That's not by any stretch, I am not suggesting that. All that I am saying is that if applications are received, we will certainly examine and take a call. But at this point, your RBI is ruling out entry of uh, 
at this house. point there is no thinking in that direction right right uh, you know your predecessor um, mr subarao in his book uh, i mean both of you have worked both in the government as well as the rbi now in his book and i quote him he says there is little understanding and sensitivity within the government on the importance of central bank autonomy he also wrote that he was invariably discomfited and annoyed by this demand that the rbi should be a cheerleader for the government now that you have spent five and a half years most in rbi as a central bank governor and especially it is important because you came in at a time when there was a huge tension between the two institutions what has your experience been and how do you respond to the fact that there is always this demand on the rbi that you be a cheerleader for the government no nobody expects rbi at least i am saying from my experience nobody expects rbi to be a cheerleader i have had uh, no such experience and uh, the coordination between the central bank that is rbi and the government uh, during crisis times like the covid where i think uh, very smooth and it was the coordination and cooperation between the fiscal and monetary authorities which ensured that our economy revived and revived very fast and revived stronger uh, in the aftermath of the covid-19 uh, pandemic there had been differences of opinion because differences between fiscal authorities and monetary authorities between government and central banks are inherent in the system it is there are bound to be differences because it is inherent but what we have done is to sort of discuss this directly between the government and the reserve bank and whenever there are differences of opinion they have been internally discussed and they have been resolved right right uh, now on interest rates the invariable question on interest rates you know the minority view in mpc was that uh, as interest rate trend downwards the real repo rate goes up so long as rbi holds the line second growth may be sacrificed on account of interest rates staying higher for longer then there is the fed chairman saying the other day that he will not wait till inflation reaches the 2% level we also heard a bis official saying that uh, while well, inflation target should be a guidance for central banks it should not become an obsession now that you have already said repeatedly that so you are focused on a 4% sustained inflation rate but that is not visible at this point of time so would you like uh, would rbi be open to reconsider its stance is the first thing i want to clarify is that uh, bis report uh, you know quoting a certain bis official he has been actually quoted out of context when he said that uh, uh, what was that sentence you said that, uh, um, while interest rates should be a guide a target should be a guidance it should not be an obsession yeah he said it in a different context i have read that full article and he said it in a different context what he meant is that just because you reach the inflation target it doesn't mean that you start cutting rates he was saying it from that perspective so the first part of his sentence says that you know the target is not very sacrosanct it doesn't mean that once you re, you know yeah. so therefore what he meant is that just because you reach the target don't start cutting the rates so he was saying in a different way altogether in fact i would uh, suggest that that article is is read in totality because what he is arguing in that article is exactly the opposite he is saying that inflation targeting is very important and central banks should stay the course now with regard to growth coming nearer home with regard to india with regard to growth sacrifice we monitor the growth numbers very carefully and i have said it on number of occasions because the law in our country the reserve bank of india act says that reserve bank is mandated to maintain price stability and price stability in terms of maintaining inflation at 4% so we are mandated is to maintain price stability keeping in mind the objective of growth so in all our monetary policy decisions growth aspect is always kept in mind and i can say that even with the current interest rates the growth in india has been very robust last 3 years the average growth rate has been 8.5 8.3 percent in the last uh, three years. This year, our projection is 7.2 percent, and we are very 
uh, optimistic that 7.2% will be achieved. In fact, the now-casting team of the Reserve Bank, and it has been published in the State of the Economy Bulletin article which we released yesterday, the now-cast team of the Reserve Bank believes that the first quarter growth, that is uh, April to June growth is 7.4%, although our internal, uh, you know, uh, what MPC said was that it is 7.3%. And we see even today the growth momentum in the second quarter continues to be very strong. The fourth quarter of last year was 7.8%. The first quarter, the numbers will be released uh, in the end of uh, August. And, uh, yeah, end of August. So the first quarter of this year, the momentum of economic activity is strong. And we see clear evidence of that momentum being sustained in the second quarter also. So growth is holding steady. Now we have to therefore focus clearly and unambiguously on inflation. And uh, this talk of, uh, you know, neutral rate, etc. In fact, another bulletin article by our researchers yesterday have shown that now that, you know, that earlier uh, neutral rate of uh, 0.8 to 1 percent was immediately in the aftermath of the COVID pandemic, when potential growth was low. But now that the impact of COVID is well behind us. The potential, the, you know, the potential growth is now gone up and the neutral rate of interest is now pegged in the range of 1.5 to 1.9 percent. So even if you were to argue that the real rates are high, it's not so because the real rates, the range is 1.4 to 1.9. And also the point is, I have said it again a few days ago, what is our target? Our target is inflation. And what are we supposed to keep in mind? We are supposed to keep in mind growth. We look at all aspects that are happening in the economy. We look at international developments. We also look at real interest rates. It's not as if we don't look at them. Finally, we take a call. The target is inflation. The target is not neutral rate of interest. So therefore, a neutral rate of interest, again, is subject to a lot of uncertainty. It depends on your assessment of potential growth versus my assessment of potential growth or versus somebody else's assessment of personal, you know, potential growth. So target is inflation. Monetary policy has to be geared to achieve that, keeping in mind the objective of growth. Neutral rate, etc., are theoretical abstract concepts that cannot determine policy in the real world. Uh, there has sorry been, for those long answers. No, no, no. It's there has been a series of actions, again, in BSCs, banks, and other institutions for non-compliance. Are you worried about this overall culture of non-compliance? Do you, do you think too many institutions are taking unacceptable risks? No, let me emphasize, as I just did a uh, little while ago, that uh, it is not so. There are outliers. Totally, if you look at, uh, we have 9,000, we have about uh, 90 odd uh, banks. We have about 1,400 uh, odd uh, urban cooperative banks. We have about 9,400 uh, NBFCs. Now, all these are lenders. If you put together, it's about 11 or 12,000 uh, banks and, you know, banks and NBFCs and cooperative banks also. Out of that, we have taken action against uh, maybe four or five or six and after six months or after eight months when there is compliance, we, you know, sort of uh, withdraw the business restrictions which we have imposed on them. So action has been taken only against about five or six or seven entities out of this universe of 11,000 odd uh, financial entities. So therefore, I think it's not correct. I think I want to dispel that uh, sense that, you know, Reserve Bank is, uh, uh, you know, chasing and going all out to sort of, uh, is on a sort of... Uh, uh, we, we don't play a 2020 game. I mean, we are there in test cricket. We have to be steady in our approach. We engage with wherever, and these are outliers. Let me very clearly say, these are outliers, very few outliers. Whenever we see such problem, our first effort is to engage with them bilaterally. We engage for months and sometimes more than a year also. But where we see that the compliance is not happening or the compliance is slow or, you know, it is not adequate, there we have to impose business restrictions because the idea is not to penalize them. The idea, the business restrictions are imposed in the interest of the customers. 
because if the business grows when there is an inherent problem eventually the customer is put into difficulty so all our actions have been taken in the best interest of customers interest so therefore we take action after months or after more than one year of engagement with the entities wherever we take and these are only very few cases overall the system remains very resilient and very strong uh governor the union budget is just about 3 days uh, away now now uh, while the gdp grew at about 8% uh, um, over 8% actually in fy24 uh, the domestic consumption growth is half of that 4% so uh, what would you like to see the fiscal authorities do on that you see i would not it's not proper for me to comment on the budget especially because it's just uh, you know next week uh so i don't want to comment on the budget but so far as consumption is concerned uh i would like to say that uh, urban consumption has been doing well for quite some time after the in fact immediately after the covid urban consumption has revived very well but i think in the last few months we have seen rural consumption also to have picked up and we are very optimistic about rural consumption because the monsoon this year is doing well is expected to do well agriculture is expected to do well the sowing the crop sowing so far has been very satisfactory so therefore the agricultural production is likely to be high and that will put more hands in the hands of the rural people quite naturally in this season and because of monsoon and because of good agricultural uh, uh, you know good agricultural output the demand on narega uh, has also come down then uh, so far as uh, you know the what do you call the uh, uh, fmcg sales for example uh, the fmcg sales over the last few months in the rural sector have actually outpaced the urban uh, fmcg consumption so we are quite optimistic about the rural consumption uh, you know to have uh, picked up so consumption is picking up and uh, you know certain measures like for example the free rice scheme is leaving that much more money in the hands of uh, the rural people to spend on their other consumption and uh, inflation the whole idea of bringing down inflation is that to reduce the burden on the people both urban consumers as well as rural consumers so if you measure today the inflation is at 5 5.1 so just measure quantify if the inflation goes to uh, let us say uh, 4% that 1% difference and that 1% additional money which will be available you know if you just try to extrapolate on that basis how much of surplus will be left in the uh, you know disposable surplus will be left in the hands of the people which they are going to spend on the economy i think the contribution to the growth will be enormous so therefore inflation management a stable inflation at 4% will be the biggest contributor to our gdp and we are moving towards that uh, this uh, latest print which went up again to 5.1 this of the earlier number of 4.75 was mainly caused by the vegetable prices uh, past experience shows that they have been seasonal but we have to see how this year plays out i only just have a couple of more questions uh, uh, this you know banks or financial entities exposure in unsecured lending personal loans even project finance has come under rbi's attention because uh, of rising bad loans but if you look at the numbers in fy uh, march 2024 loans to agriculture sector the uh, the bad loans were the highest and then came industry do you think is there a need uh, to explore raising the provision requirement for agriculture loans so that banks can price it effectively if i remember correctly subject to correction with regard to agricultural loans the latest uh, gnpa figures are about 6 6.5% i think that was march uh, 24 24 yeah yeah it was about 6 6.5% three or four years ago it was 10% so it has come down and i would not like to comment on any specific sector but i would just like to draw your attention 
to the expected credit loss uh, framework, which we have, uh, you know, the draft of which uh, we have uh, put in place. It's a draft which we have put in place in the public domain. We are getting the comments. Based on that, we will issue the circular on expected credit loss. So when that circular is issued, it will address all such problems of, uh, you know, any uh, higher NPA or risk buildup in any particular sector, not just agriculture, but in every, you know, wherever uh, it is visible. But today, as you are aware, the GNPA levels are at a historic low. The bank's GNPA is 2.8%. So far as the NBFCs are concerned, it is at about 4%. In fact, if you take out the, uh, you know, the NBFC loans, which are uh, under resolution in NCLT, et cetera, the, you know, the GNPA is less than uh, 3%, and, uh, or around, yeah, about less than 3%. So therefore, uh, I think overall, the problem of bad loans is now well contained, but we have to remain there. That is why, you know, we keep on giving all those uh, cautionary advice. It's not as if there is a big problem and we are worried and we are trying to deal with it. It is basically the current times are good times. We don't want the bad times to come back. We want the good times to last and we want the good times to put it in a metaphorically. We want the good times to become even better times. Right. Uh, I know you, um, you love cricket, so this in, uh, uh, the question is, that one of your uh, favorite cricketers, Rahul Dravid, he loved playing test matches. Now, but as the RBI governor, and going the, given the volatility in the external world, you must be forced to play T20 cricket almost every day. How do you cope up with it? Well, first of all, I mean, uh, I would like to say that uh, whatever, I mean, uh, uh, Anant uh, Goenka just uh, said all those nice things about uh, me. But whatever we have been able to do, I must say very clearly that it is the outcome of the effort of the entire team at the Reserve Bank, in the entire team in the Reserve Bank of India. I cannot corner all the credit to myself. Reserve, we have a good, uh, you know, robust team in the Reserve Bank. So it is the entire outcome of the entire teamwork. So modern times have become much more uncertain, much more, uh, you know, there are new challenges uh, coming every day. And uh, so therefore we have to deal with it. I think, uh, uh, I don't want to be philosophical, but I think uh, <laughs> the principle is to maintain your cool. And uh, sort of, uh, I think the word uh, Captain Cool has been mentioned about Dhoni. Yeah. So the approach has to be a mix of uh, Captain Cool, Dhoni, and uh, Rahul Dravid's, uh, you know, approach. But having said that, let me say that the both both the cricketers did not play to draw the game; they played to win the game, and I think both of them have won the game. So that's our uh, commitment. That's our of the endeavour. Finally, Governor, uh, your uh, this term uh, ends in December. Uh, you know, I, 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 I would not want to uh, uh, say whether, are you open to another stint as RBI governor? I don't know, as uh, December 10th is approaching, I think I'm increasingly confronted with this question. But honestly, I'm really focused on my current work. And uh, I said it elsewhere also, I'm completely focused on my current work. And I don't think, uh, you know, anything uh, outside that. So focus remains on the current work. And what will happen in the future? One has to deal with it as and when uh, uh, the situation arises. I mean, why do I, why do I sort of uh, worry about that? Let me first focus on the ball which I am now playing. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll